Um, so hi, good afternoon. My name is Caitlin Saposi Belknap. I moved to a men's national director and we appreciate you taking the time this afternoon to learn more about the We the People Amendment, which will be reintroduced in um, the house soon. We are holding out for the number 48, which we have had for the last three Congresses. The amendment has in been introduced. This will be the fifth time. So um, we are on, you guys are on 37 House Joint Resolutions as of this morning. So we're inching our way towards 48. And in preparation, um, before we get there, we are trying to maximize the number of initial co-sponsors that are signed on. Um, we, we ended last Congress with 75, 68 of those members are still in the House, and we're hoping for some new ones too. So we'll talk more about that. Um, I want to introduce Greg Coleridge, actually this way, uh, Move to Amend's Outreach Director, and he's going to take the lead on the presentation here, and um, then we will open it up for questions. We also have a few uh, materials that we will send to you as follow up at the end. So, and we can also send you the slides from this um, presentation and the recording as well. I know there were a couple people who were gonna have to come in late or jump off early or who wanted to get the recording. So we'll just make sure that everyone who registered uh, receives that. So in the interest of time, we're not going to do introductions. We're just going to go ahead and jump in. Um, and so I'm going to hand it over to you, Greg, to get us started. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. I appreciate, again, you taking the time to be here um, this afternoon. Um, so this is about the We the People Amendment uh, promoted by Move to Amend, and just wanted to give a very quick uh, presentation as to sort of the background, how we got into the mess that we're in and why we believe one of the fundamental ways to address that mess is by passing this We the People Amendment. And a good place to begin is by looking at the U.S. Constitution, which if you look at it, which I'm sure we all have read from cover to cover, there basically is a description of two main agents is there not in it? The first being the first three words in the preamble, we the people, and the other uh, entity that the Constitution addresses is the, um, the institution that we the people create to, that we delegate our powers to, and that's a government. So we the people are free and sovereign, right? We took over that sovereignty from the king in which we have the ultimate authority to decide what uh, is best for us individually and collectively. Um, we, the people, free and sovereign people, have individual rights. Those rights are not granted by any entity, but uh, are inalienable based on the fact that they <clears throat> um, are uh, ours by birth. And, um, you know, we express those rights uh, privately. Uh, and that's sort of the one part of the Constitution. Again, the other part being the other agent is the government, which is subordinate and accountable to us, right? Uh, it's accountable, not responsible. Only human beings can be responsible. But by being accountable and subordinate, it takes its orders, its direction, its authority, its definition, its instruction from us. And uh, among those sort of functions that it uh, performs in our name with our um, permission via delegation are certain duties. And those duties take the form of passing various public rights, laws, policies, statutes, uh, regulations, and the like. So that's basically how government is supposed to work um, under this um, ultimate definition, uh, this authority that sort of defines uh, us collectively and is the reflection of our inspiration and aspirations. So um, unfortunately, along the way, um, well, it's sort of a double-edged sword. Initially, it was um, certainly um, uh, incredibly important that uh, government, again, in our name, to, to have certain functions performed, they created corporations. But those corporations were created via these things called licenses or charters. And these charters were during this period of time, somewhat beforehand and somewhat afterwards, in fact, still up to the present, but not 
with uh, these limitations, certainly, but during this period of time, these charters or licenses, again, were very limited in what they could do. Because again, we the people, we were the ones in charge, and we wanted to make sure that these entities that were created by government, mostly at the state level, was uh, going to perform certain uh, you know, services or providing certain functions, uh, certain goods that would be done to provide, you know, uh, to meet uh, the common good, to obey all laws and to meet these you know, needs of our society. But there were certain very distinct pro-democratic uh, limitations. And these are some of them. Limited lifespan, they couldn't own one corporation, another one. They certainly couldn't donate or contribute to any civic purpose. Uh, corporations that gave money to a campaign, that was a felony, with a limited liability. Uh, they couldn't own property outside of the very specific purpose for their charter. So if their charter was to, I don't know, build tables, they could only own the land with enough trees on it to you know, cut down to build tables. And there was no interlocking board of directors and the directors most of the time had to live in the state where the corporation did business. So as you can see very defining, very uh, limiting. Uh, and again, we were in charge. These uh, charters that government, again, that we delegated to government uh, were government created one at a time charters, mostly at the state level. All right, so when you look at it in that way, uh, again, looking at it in this schema, corporations would fall under the side of government, right? They were government created. They were subordinate and accountable. They had specific duties. And in a sense, their job or their duties were to create useful goods and services. However, along the way, and here's where some of the problems began, corporations didn't particularly like this kind of democratic control, again, relatively speaking, democratic control. Um, they sought to become more independent. And so one of the ways among the three that they chose to do that was to shift decision-making from the legislative arena, particularly at the state level, to the judicial arena, to escape this sort of democratic decision-making that these people in our name, who we elected at the state level, were performing. And so here was kind of the first, if you will, constitutional trial balloon. This decision in 1882, in which uh, corporations with a straight face claimed that uh, the court should invent 14th Amendment due process and equal protection to protect this railroad corporation. It didn't get very far, but it was the first time that before the Supreme Court, this notion, this argument, sort of planting the seed that corporate entities should have inalienable rights was planted. It took certainly much greater uh, impetus and uh, grounding and rootedness four years later. In this case that maybe some of you have heard of, Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad, where, I mean, there's a lot of backstory to it. We won't get to it. If you're interested in the questions uh, and discussion part, we can. But basically the judges and the justices uh, agreed with a very liberal interpretation of what the case was about, that corporations should have due process uh, uh, rights. And that decision served as a uh, springboard and as a precedent for the striking down of literally hundreds of uh, laws that was passed at the local, state, and federal levels that were designed to protect people from a variety of corporate harms. So again, first time corporations were deemed in one form that of uh, due process, um, a, an equal protection, more, more like uh, equal, pro equal protection, a natural person. In earnest, because the 14th Amendment has a lot of provisions, but three years later, in this case, the Supreme Court ruled for all intents and purposes that a person, corporation was a person that had both due process and equal protection. And so to violate that would be discriminatory. And it should be said just as a side note that subsequent to uh, these decisions in 1886 and 1889 for the next like half century or so, before the court, there were somewhere in the order of, you know, 50 or more decisions that came before the court uh, under the 14th Amendment. Most of them pertain to corporations. Only a handful pertain to the constituency that the 14th Amendment was designed to protect freed slaves. 
this was the ultimate outrageous perversion of a Supreme Court, um, uh, of a constitutional uh, decision and of a, a constitutional amendment. So that began sort of the uh, trend toward the, what you could say, hijacking of uh, the law and of the constitution. This case in 1905 was uh, one where, again, very liberally and uh, creatively, the 14th Amendment was used under the Due Process Clause to violate literally a couple of hundred various regulations, most of them economic, including various uh, regulations uh, trying to limit, if not prevent, child labor, fair wages, um, you know, workplace safety. And so from 1905 to the mid 1930s, all of these democratically passed laws that mostly the state level were overturned, were preempted because of the 14th Amendment. Again, a court, a, I should say a constitutional um, Supreme Court um, amendment that was meant and designed exclusively for freed slaves, but was perverted because of this invention of corporate rights. Hale versus Henkel. So it's not just the perversion of the 14th Amendment, but there are several other amendments along the way. This case, 1906, Fourth Amendment search and seizure protections. So this was a, a, a problem uh, for hereafter, uh, communities that were trying to pass various forms of regulation or trying to keep companies sort of um, responsible or I should say accountable to the public by being able up to that point, by being able to look in, in the corporate records, books, papers, but a corporation said in this case, no, that's a violation of my fourth amendment. Again, bill of rights protection. This was the first instance where the bill of rights was perverted. Again, bill of rights was intended to apply exclusively to human persons, period. But corporations argued that the fourth amendment search and seizure protections should apply to them. Supreme court went along. Uh, Dodge versus Ford Motor Company, the first instance where a, uh, a Supreme Court, in this case, a state Supreme Court, said that stockholder primacy is uber alles, is the most singular, most important principle when it comes to a corporation functioning. Never mind social responsibility, never mind being sort of accountable to the public, accountable to government, accountable to uh, we the people. Nope, it's sort of maximizing pro uh, profit to give and to benefit stockholders. Pennsylvania Coal Company versus Mahon, first time that the Fifth Amendment, a lot of provisions of it, in particular, what's called the takings clause. If you're an individual, the government can't take your property unless two conditions are met. It's for a public purpose and you are justly compensated. But in this case, there were um, uh, landowners whose homes were sinking because this coal company was mining coal underneath their homes and these homes were literally sinking into the ground. So these people felt hard to believe, they felt that their property should be protected and that a regulation, a law, an act that had been passed prior to uh, 1922 that prevented or regulated the amount of coal underneath people's homes should be limited. The company said, nope, to do that would be a violation of the takings clause, meaning that I'm gonna lose profit both in the present and future. The court went along with it, and this sort of was the beginning of what has continued to be. You know, there still are obviously regulations against uh, to limit what corporations can do, but those regulations are, think of it as a box, are being limited each and every year uh, and every decision by this precedent, basically, that a corporation and a regulation limiting what a corporation can do is deemed a taking and has to be you know, very clearly defined and can't in the end be too harsh. Going back to the 14th amendment, add to it a perversion of the existing commerce clause of the constitution here, the people of Florida passed a law that levied a differential tax on chain stores versus local stores. Supreme court, you know, the chain store said, whoa, that's discriminatory under the 14th Amendment. You are discriminating against me. Again, a hijack, a perversion of the 14th Amendment in which discrimination was meant to apply solely to freed slaves, but was a win and has begun, was the, the beginning of many subsequent uh, uh, decisions. In fact, so many that today, like some of these constitutional amendments, they aren't even challenged anymore because communities know they're gonna lose 
And so these decisions serve as, quote unquote, uh, serve as a chilling effect. We don't even try to challenge these kinds of perversions or hijacking of constitutional amendments to protect our local community, to protect local businesses, to protect our environment, because we know we're gonna lose because corporations are being shielded behind these constitutional amendments. All right, Buckley versus Vallejo is the first of a number of uh, Supreme Court decisions that deal with money. In this case, money being defined for the first time as free speech, if money is speech, well, my friends, those who have the most money have the most speech, not a real good definition of anything approaching an authentic democracy. So under the First Amendment, it is deemed money equals free speech, political speech. Here, a year later was the first time where a Supreme Court decision said free speech as it applies to money being spent for political purposes applies to corporations. In this case, to exclusively and only at this point, referendum. So here, for the first time, business corporations could spend money on supporting or defeating a referendum in the state of Massachusetts. So it didn't apply at that time to political candidates or campaigns, only to referendum. But when you add in First National Bank decision with Buckley, you have this dual impact that has been a real uh, attempt to remove um, you know, our ability to decide for ourselves what uh, elections should be like and the results of elections. International Dairy Foods, this decision in 1996 was uh, one in which, again, this applied to First Amendment, but not First Amendment political speech, and said other elements of the First Amendment. First Amendment, in this case, the right with a straight face, the uh, uh, corporation argued the right not to speak. So here are the good folks of Vermont chose that they should have the right to require, not even prohibiting bovine growth hormones from being in dairy products, but just the labeling of them. Corporations came back and said, dairy industry, no, that's a violation of my right not to speak. So the court, in essence, agreed that human beings, that families who are trying to provide and have the right to know what kind of uh, ingredients or chemicals are in milk products served to their children, it takes a back seat to the corporate right not to speak, uh, along with other uh, right not to speaks that are mentioned there, commercial speak, including the right not to lie. That's what the extend, extending to the statement of fact is. So corporations now, even when it comes to commercial speech, have won constitutionally the right to lie. Citizens United versus federal elections. Now, here people believe this is for the, for the very first time corporations won uh, First Amendment, free speech, rights to be involved in elections. But as we can see, this goes back a very long way. This decision, though, as that last bullet point mentioned, was been, has been, to some extent, at that time, certainly, the most recent and certainly the most blatant instance of corporations uh, winning these greater rights, as well as, it should be said, wealthy individuals, which under uh, Citizens United was also expanded the ability to donate or invest in political elections. So it overturned campaign uh, McCain-Feingold, as well as a couple dozen uh, campaign finance laws at the state level. You know, the right at, at the state level for people to determine how much money should be spent on elections was just preempted almost overnight. So it basically ushered in much more blatantly this notion of legalized bribery in elections. But it was followed up four years later by this uh, other case, McCutcheon, that opened the door to expanding the limitations of uh, money being spent uh, on elections and the amount of money that could go to national parties and federal candidate committees, as well as it removed the ability and the amount of money and the limitation that very wealthy individuals could spend cumulatively on campaign, uh, can on candidate campaigns. So the individual donors up to this point had sort of a maximum amount they could give out in any uh, federal uh, campaign. You know, you can give out, I don't know what it was, $120,000, but you could spend that to however many candidates you wanted, but it can only go to, you know, cumulatively add up to 120000 whatever the amount was. Following this case, you could give literally the maximum amount per person, literally to every single candidate running for Congress and the Senate, everyone. So that's what McCutcheon did. Burwell versus Hobby Lobby, 2014, maybe you've heard of this case. It came up to the very edge. It did not, in essence, cross the precipice to say that it is, in fact, 
uh, corporations have religious rights, but what it did do is it gave the owners of this uh, for-profit, prof a closely held for-profit corporation, uh, the right in the name of the corporation to liberally, much more liberally interpret the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. So it rooted and grounded and strengthened, if you will, the Religious uh, Restor Freedom Restoration Act to say it applies to corporations in making sure that their religious rights, not the individual owners, but the corporation's religious rights are upheld. So it strengthened that uh, power and that ability for corporations under that act, but came awfully close. And we do know, do we not, that one that sort of um, a ceiling in one year when it comes to a, a law or a constitutional decision becomes the floor the next. And so we can probably surely expect that Hobby Lobby will be used as a precedent to cross that precipice if and when the next, well, more like when the next time a corporation argues with a straight face that its religious laws, religious rights are being violated by being forced by the government to do such and such. In this case, it was to, pre to provide uh, female employees contraceptive coverage. Okay, so when, when corporations win all of these constitutional rights, they move from this one arena, from being, you know, from one side of the equation, of uh, being sort of subordinate and accountable and being directed by we the people to now becoming one of us, if you will. And so it perverts this whole scheme of we the people being free and sovereign and having individual rights because now corporations have these individual rights. They now can trump or pervert or preempt our sovereignty to control ourselves because now they argue that they have rights and since they live forever, they can exert those rights long after we are gone. So it just sort of just perverts this whole notion of we are in charge and we have these entities that we instruct, that we define, that we authorize to do on our behalf, including these entities secondarily that, that government creates, namely corporations. And they no longer are subordinate or accountable. They now have power and authority to dictate to us. They have turned, my friends, the Bill of Rights, the 14th Amendment and all the rest on its head. And we are now the ones playing defense. And that is why that we believe the We the People Amendment is so very important because it makes clear that artificial entities, all artificial entities don't have constitutional rights in uh, total. It makes clear that spending money on elections is not protected by the First Amendment. It can be regulated by we the people. It requires public campaign spending to be disclosed and it will soon, as uh, Caitlin mentioned, be introduced by Representative uh, Jayapal. Some of you may be well aware of For the People Act, which is getting uh, quite a bit of airtime and legislative attention, rightly so, uh, just to sort of compare and contrast what it is versus what the people is. Basically, it comes down to, and we can send you some background material that goes into much more details of this, but as some of you may know, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of comparing apples versus oranges because HR or HR1 is a law, a proposed law, it's legislation, it's a statute, whereas we are promoting a constitute and proposing a constitutional amendment. So what it is trying to do fundamentally is in essence more fundamental because courts cannot overturn it like they could overturn certain provisions and the ones in particular that we're dealing with here and we're most interested in is the campaign finance provisions. So those elements of For the People Act of which campaign financing is one of those three categories certainly are at risk of being overturned by, as we know, a Supreme Court that is quite pro-corporate and is going to be showing its pro-corporate cards in the days, weeks, months, years, uh, sadly, maybe decades to come uh, unless things uh, uh, change. So we have to do an end run around that. And that's what the We the People Amendment is to create a movement that creates this constitutional amendment that says, no, we're not gonna leave it in the hands of the court to decide whether something is legit or not, or whether provisions of the For the People Act should withstand uh, law or not, we have to make sure we have to guarantee it. So hopefully the For the People Act will pass with some alterations. We believe that's a whole nother matter uh, concerning the campaign finance section, but even those provisions that we think are decent within the campaign finance reform section should and, and could be quite honestly challenged by uh, the courts without there being this constitutional amendment. 
Um, the other thing that maybe you're aware of that you've heard about that your boss has maybe already signed up for is the Democracy for All Amendment. So it is a constitutional amendment that like HGR 48 is a constitutional amendment, but it is only a piece in essence. And we believe with all due respect, a pretty weak and incomplete piece compared to HGR 48. It doesn't have the provisions as you can see uh, that speak to the rights of limiting uh, corporations uh, or preventing corporations from having the rights of natural persons. A and it does, if you look at that sort of third area down there, comparing and contrasting, Congress and the states underscore, and this is, it's not in the legislation, this is my emphasis, underlining the word may regulate and set reasonable limits on the raising and spending of money on candidates and others to influence elections, whereas our amendment says federal, state, and local governments shall regulate, limit, or prohibit contributions and expenditures. That simple word in contrast is really a major, major change, may or shall. Just think for a moment, my friends, if this was applied to, oh, let's say voting rights and the right to vote, would you be supportive of a constitutional amendment that said, and I don't know, that everyone may have the right to vote versus everyone shall have the right to vote? I know which constitutional amendment I'd be for. And so anyway, that's what we think uh, and what we believe the We the People Amendment is so very much stronger because it does this and it also sort of weakens the ability. The last point there is judiciary will not be able to interpret things the way they could under HJR 1 to define, redefine speech and who knows what hell ways they would try to do that. They would not have a role to define that under the We the People Amendment. Okay. Here's where we are, our progression. We've made progress from the first time this was introduced uh, in 113th session in terms of co-sponsors. Our goal from last time to this time is uh, from 75 to 100, which uh, we're very confident. And with your support, if you've not already committed, if you have committed, thank you so much. If you haven't, please do take it back to your uh, boss and spread the word among your peers. Uh, lastly, um, we have just to show you the breadth and depth of support, 705 uh, resolutions have been passed by municipalities uh, at the local county uh, state level or local county, I should say, or a congressional district level, including hundreds of uh, citizen initiatives. So there have been resolutions passed by villages and city councils and the like, but also about 300 citizen initiatives. In addition, among those 705 are seven states that have passed uh, uh, either resolutions or in four instances, ballot initiatives, Montana, Colorado, California, Washington, and you can see Montana is not sort of uh, California or Washington, is it? So we believe this initiative, uh, this resolution is not just bipartisan, but transpartisan. Hundreds of thousands of uh, citizen volunteers and over 600 organizations have endorsed this initiative from community groups, dozens of law firms, labor unions, and faith uh, congregations. So appreciate uh, you uh, taking the time. Sorry if I've gone over, uh, we can cuss and discuss and hear your questions. Thank you. You're good, Greg. I don't think you, I think you went just the right amount of time. So um, we do have some time for any questions or discussion. Um, you can use the little raise your hand uh, icon at the bottom of your screen, or you could just take yourself off mute and speak. Um, we'll give it a little bit to see if anybody has any questions. Looks oh, funny. now I couldn't have been that complete other than maybe completely confusing all of you. And I hope that was not the case. <laughs> you would surely have some questions, if nothing else, to challenge us or you know, unsure about something. So please do nonviolently fire away. <laughs> Maybe it's not the right way to use these days. Apologies. We will be sending, like I said, and I know some of you came in late, so we will send the recording if you missed the first part or any any part. Um, and then we also will send the slides um, and we have a couple of handouts. We'll send you the text of the amendment if you don't already have it. I know a number of offices that are here have already signed on, so thank you for that. Um, 
uh, but we'll also send you that comparison of the HJR1 versus HJR48, and then just a background summary of these cases too. It's helpful. Well, it looks like there are no questions. So um, we'll- All of your offices should have gotten the white paper, correct? Um, I believe so. I'm not 100% sure on that, but um, I could also include that in the in the follow up just to make sure, which is a longer document kind of outline much more detail. Um, I'm sorry, I did have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I come to the meeting late because there was a conflict. Did we have any of our uh, representatives um, uh, tune in to the meeting? Um, there are a number of staff members who are here from different offices, yes. Oh, that's great. Okay, thank you. Yep. Anybody else have any questions? All right, well then, um, We'll wish you a good rest of your Tuesday and we'll be sending those follow-ups when the recording is done. So probably tomorrow morning, we'll, we'll be able to send all that out to you. And then we will check, be checking in with every office <clears throat> that is here that is not already signed on and committed. Um, reminder that uh, Pramila Jayapal is the lead, Amy Fisher in her office. She had a medical, um, she had to go to the doctor last minute this morning. So she was gonna be here. So she's not here, but um, we'll make sure to include uh, her email address, um, which is who you should contact when your office is ready to sign on. And then we will be following up to just check and make sure um, that you're ready to go if you're not already signed on. So thanks for being here and for your support of the We The People Amendment and have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you.